And we rejoice to speak of these things from this text. I love these texts from the Gospel of John, these from the prophets that declare what God is working in the earth. And, and we see then how he has unfolded these things in the Gospel and the exposition of the apostles and prophets in the spirit, uh, precious and true things. I've spent the last two weeks, hours, uh, looking and thinking and meditating and sleeping on this text, <laughs> literally thinking about it as I went to sleep and, and waking up thinking about it. It's a real precious thing, exceeding precious thing to have that uh, perspective, to be able to have that perspective and to, uh, to dwell uh, on, on these things that have been made known to us in our Savior. Mm -hmm. The Master spoke these words his last few days of ministry in Jerusalem. Many think that this section of John's Gospel was his last, were his last public statements to the crowds, the last time that they heard him speak. And these are the closing words. Last two or three thoughts that he declared after, after years of walking among them, doing staggering signs and wonders, saying things that no man said. Uh, even uh, months before this, they had declared, John records it in the seventh chapter, where did this man get this learning? Yeah. Having never been educated or having letters, not having letters, when a, I think the King James says, doesn't it? So they, they were stunned at the, things, at the things that he was saying. But he was sent for this purpose, to declare these things, uh, to make this truth known. God has, this is something that I've exceedingly appreciated about our studies in Genesis and the, and the, and the connections that the brother has made for us uh, to see how God is establishing this environment to then... Reveal these things. That's what he's doing. To show himself strong and wise and true and righteous and good and full of wrath and jealous. All, all, of, all of these things. God has established. Reminded me of the words here in Isaiah 47, 5, 45, 7. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. I, the Lord, do these things. So God has provided this environment where we would see these things, a place of darkness where he could then give light. He can cover up, he can uncover, he can display, he can hide. And he does all of these things. He does all of these things. So the master spoke these words then, John 12, 46, I have come as a light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. His, his dwelling among the people, his, his deeds, his words uh, shocked and astounded, stunned like the light does, you know. When you get up and you turn the light on and you're, oh, oh, you, you, uh, a, a, a bright light, a brighter light shines in your face, you know. You, you, I'm, I work, you know, of course, in the warehouse there, and we've got lights all over the place and so forth. But I open that big overhead door, especially this time of year, and the sun, the blinding sun, just comes in that south door and just blinds you. Well, this, is the, this was the experience of, of those who sat in his audience. Even the disciples. The close association that they had with him over those months and years and we know that during that first year, uh, maybe in the middle part of the second year, when the, when the storm came down in Galilee, when he was asleep in the boat, and you remember their reaction, who is this? Now, they'd walked with him. They'd seen him do miracles. I, I can't think of the chronology where they'd already raised one from the dead at that point or not. And yet they said, who is this? It's almost like every, every few weeks he would do something more or he would say something more that, that they had not expected. And so now here, here is this summation, isn't it? Mm -hmm. this, this statement 
is one of many that we could peg as a summation of his work. Commission. People like to talk about the Great Commission. Well, he's, he's the one who ultimately had the Great Commission, didn't he? <laughs> he certainly did. From the Father. And he was faithful doing the Father's work. Sent to his own. And his own didn't receive him. But those who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children, the sons of God. Amen. Because he was light. He himself was light from the Father. Brother Tony's going to read some of that text there, and I've got some of that text to highlight tonight. John uses this word light in his record of the Master's life 29 times. I'm sorry, 23 times. And then six more times he uses it in his first letter. And each time he uses it, it's, it has something to do with perception and spiritual light. Every time that he uses it, it's, it's some communication, some spiritual communication that the Father and the Son of themselves or them giving it to someone else, granting light and perception to someone else. <clears throat> Six times in his opening few statements of his gospel, six times he uses this word about Jesus' identity, particularly about Jesus' identity. He, he pins that thought to that word, who he is, light. And then he immediately begins talking about enlightenment, which is him, him granting light to others. He had that power. He had it in himself. He had the power to give it to someone else. Yeah. Amen. And that was precisely what he did. He enlightens the effect of light. And then, of course, in his letter, his first use of it is, God is light. Mm -hmm. And then he draws implications for his readers. Jesus himself uses the word 17 times mm -hmm. in his teaching in his declarations about himself concerning the Father, whom no man has seen nor can see, who dwells in unapproachable light, but the one from heaven has seen him. He has heard him and seen him, and he has come, remember he said to Nicodemus, to declare what he has seen and heard. And, of course, his listeners were, again, they, they were just stunned that someone, many, of course, were absolutely offended. Mm -hmm. Who is this man that even forgives sins? Well, he was revealing who he was. Yeah, yeah. And he was revealing that he had power on earth to forgive sins, didn't he? Amen. He did that directly. He, he asserted that reality mm -hmm. that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. I come as light. I come a light. In the beginning, of course, God made the earth dark, formless, and empty, or void. And then the first thing he did, so to speak, was release light from himself. We know it was light from him. There was no other source. There was no other source. I, first time that dawned on me wasn't that long ago. <laughs> that reality. The light was just him. He was extending himself into this place where he was preparing to do a work, and the first thing he did was to illuminate and, and, make, and make it so others, Amen. others, Amen. no other had been made on the earth. Mm -hmm. But there were others mm -hmm. who were watching. What is it Job says with Job or one of his friends that the uh, morning stars sang together yeah. at creation? I can't remember whether that was Job or one of his friends that made that statement. 
this new enterprise that God was working, he was on an initiative to do something new and different outside the realm of heaven and work a purpose in it. And so he began by infusing it with light himself so that the Apostle Paul could say that we see some aspects of his being, the divine being, his nature in creation, some, some aspects of it. He would reveal something of himself in this work. Creation, of course, was good, very good, until sin entered. Now, this, this light now didn't, didn't give an understanding to the beings that he put on the earth. It didn't give them understanding. Not what was needed to deal with the enemy of their soul. But God was working something, we know, and he began revealing it right then. This spoiler would be dealt with. When the mighty one said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. It was a person mm -hmm. yes. Amen. that would be sent into the earth. I have come as a light mm -hmm. into the world. Mm -hmm. That those who believe will not remain or abide in the darkness. So this initiative, the focus of this initiative was going to be a person yes, amen. Who, who would hate, who would hate this enemy of God. And of course, any servant of God was hated by the enemy, uh -huh. by the opposition. This one, of course, would partake of flesh and blood as the fallen children did, but he would not fall as did the first Adam. He would be strong. Because he was himself light. He had light in him and he had the power to give light of himself. Now, we know that the, the enemy and the associates of the enemy knew this, didn't they? But those to whom he was sent did not know. And so he purposely, he, he purposely then gradually revealed himself, little by little, so that you might say, so that their eyes could deal with the brightness of the light. Yeah. If, if he revealed himself all at once, well, we have, a, we have a scriptural account of that, don't we? God revealing some aspect of himself there at Sinai, and it was a terrifying experience for the people there. Yeah. Terrifying. So, this one to come would not just undo the corruption of sin, but would bring life and immortality to light. Mm -hmm. He would reveal things that had not entered the mind of man. Mm -hmm. Amen. Had not considered at all. That God had not yet revealed. Again, I appreciate in our last lesson, uh, Brother Given had a, uh, noted a number of things that Abraham did not know that we know. We take for granted. We speak about them all the time. Abraham didn't know those things. God was revealing those things at the right time, in the right portion, in the right place. Down through the generations, these details were revealed through holy men who spoke as the Spirit moved them throughout the generations of this chosen nation. These holy men he made known and so that this one who came as light then could point to these words and could point to these statements at key times and key places. He could point to these key holy people who had lived among them, whom they knew. They themselves said, we know God has spoken to Moses. Didn't they say that? Yes. Yeah. So Jesus is going to say, Moses has said this. The master could point to Moses and say, if you believed Moses, you would believe me. Yeah. Amen. Now that was a stunning revelation, wasn't it? That would hurt the eyes <laughs> to think about that. That would shock and cause the person, oh, wait, hey, hey, teacher, <laughs> teacher, when you say that, you offend us as well. But he came for that purpose, 
to show light. So we have the prophetic, Peter would write these words later, we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns, the morning star arises in your hearts. See, the uh, many who heard our Savior speak thought that they had it all. It, 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 they were stunned to think that there was more. How could there be more? What were their charges against him and against Stephen and against Paul? They're going to change the things that Moses handed down to us. They're, it was the be-all, end-all, do-all in their, in their view. How could God change? Well, he didn't change, did he? And, and the Spirit, in giving more light through our brother Paul, shows how he did not change at all. He was fulfilling the things that had been made known in the past. They just didn't get the connections. And we haven't gotten the connections in the past either, have we? And we're still getting them. We don't have all of them. We're seeing more and more. Now, the, this is the nature of these things, is it opens up and increases more and more and more. All of us, all of us have dealt with people who thought that what they had was, what they have right now is the be-all, end-all, do-all. They don't need anything else. We've had some tell us. I've had some tell me. You don't need to preach to us. You need to preach to those other people, those people who don't have it yet. We've got it. We've got it. <laughs> and I was able to say to them, well, this is an amazing thing. Yeah. I said that. This is an amazing thing because I don't have it all yet. But it's, it's really difficult to deal with people who think they've got it all, you know. It's, it's like a doctor trying to tell somebody, you're sick, man, you're sick. No, doc, leave me alone. Leave me alone. I don't need that. You need to take care of the, uh, the sick people out there in the front room, you know, in your waiting area. I'm not sick. There's nothing wrong with me. So this one who said he was the light came from the source of light, and he invaded the darkness. It tried to keep him away, didn't it? In many places down through the generations, he knew. The enemy of God knew that that word was certain, but he, he, he was persuaded he could interdict, he could detour this. He could put a stop to it. Why, look what he'd already done. He had control of everybody and everything, didn't he? Well, he thought he did. It's all been granted to me. He told this one who came to God, came from God, and was mature now, and was ready now, standing at the brink of his ministry time. And so he thought, I'll, 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 I haven't been able to stop it yet, but I get it now. I can get it now. I'll give you all of this. For it's been granted to me. <laughs> See, even in saying that, he had to confess, didn't he? Uh -huh. there, there was somebody over him that had given it to him. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. And he knew that our Savior knew that because he was the light. Mm -hmm. He came from the place of light. Amen. And he also knew <coughs> that God's enemy had been there. And rejected it. He rejected it in himself. And sought to establish his own light. He thought that the light that he had belonged to him. Somehow. And we don't know the details of this, but we, we know what pride does. And how, how it works in people. In, in the thinking, in, in twisted thinking, so... He came then from the source of life and light and invaded this darkness, which had to give him room. It could not compete, or really no competition at all. It was not able to comprehend him or fight against him at all. He just he came and did as he would do. As he was commissioned to do. He came and fulfilled these things. He came from an he came with an assignment to lay down his life and take it up again. But before this, he would demonstrate this light. He would illustrate. He would enlighten the light. <laughs> and, and proving who he was, 
and drawing whosoever would. Of course, the source, the ultimate source of the light would do this in him, draw like we know light draws insects and so forth. The heat of it, the light of it draws what well, he drew. He drew many, yeah. many, many to him. Multitudes, so much so that they were stepping on one another. So much so that they pressed him out into the, into the water in Galilee and he had to get in Peter's boat to teach. Yeah. So much so that they, he was worn out, they couldn't even eat. So much so. No one else could get in the house there. And the men who had their friend had to tear the ceiling open. They were drawn to him. They were hardly able to resist even his enemies. They followed him. They followed him from place to place to everywhere he went. There were these enemies lurking, watching, and waiting. These ones in the darkness, out along the, out along the edges, you know. Like you, th you think of someone traveling through an area and so forth, and there's an enemy hiding in the dark bushes and so forth. Well, that, that's what these men were doing. They were waiting. They were just waiting for an opportunity. One word. One misstep in his words. And, of course, they thought they'd found it many times. But he was able to turn it. On them, just turned it right back on them. It was just just a statement, mm -hmm. or 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 he could he could form and and this is because he was the light. See, he could turn their own words back on them. He could make them say things that oh oh, after they'd said it, they knew that he got them. Yeah. They were caught, mm -hmm. or they couldn't answer. Mm -hmm. I too will ask you a question. Yeah. He said. John's baptism, was it from heaven or from men? And, of course, panic. These men who were normally expert debaters. They immediately knew. He, they were caught. They could not answer. All of the people standing around listening, their own conduct and behavior as they rejected John. And that's only one of many examples of how he shone the light. They could not escape being exposed. Like you come into the room and you flip on the light and there's rodents in there and they scatter everywhere. Well, that's what he did. He came. I have come, he said. And this light burst upon Judea and the Galilean hillsides. Amen. And the people were swept away after him. And the audience, or the, the, the enemies were, were uh, they could not let go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They had to deal with this man. He was undoing their careers. He was undoing the, the tidy circumstance that they had for themselves. Of course, there were a few. They wouldn't confess it publicly, but there were a few who were irresistibly in their hearts drawn to him, yeah. as Nicodemus and Joseph. Mm -hmm. And there were others. Remember what Nicodemus said to him? We know yeah. that you are a prophet sent from God, a teacher sent from God. No man could do these things unless God is with him. Mm -hmm. He'd already drawn that implication. He knew, he knew that was true. We know how many others were there who when they got alone, that's all they could talk about. What's the latest news? What's he done now? Oh, oh my. You can imagine their reactions when the word came from, uh, from Perea or Decapolis, around Galilee, the lake, the sea, or up in Cana. The word began to trickle down into Jerusalem about things like that, things that happened in Nain. Someone would say, Nain, Nain, where's Nain? I've, I've heard of it before, but it's a, that kind of, he raised somebody from the dead? Because they had spies out there looking and watching. They were all exposed, of course, because you couldn't get close to him without the light exposing you. That's what it does. That's its nature. It enlightens everything. 
and of course we know that some don't want to be enlightened. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, John wrote. The light shines in the darkness. The darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all that through him, that all through him might believe. He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of the light. Stunning thing, isn't it? That statement. Does a light need a witness? Well, it got one. And it just enhanced it even more. It's kind of like, you know, this light fixture here, does it really need those glass fixture things, tulip-like things around them? It doesn't, but it makes it look nice, doesn't it? It kind of draws your attention. It's attractive. So that's something like what John was. And he made Jesus look very attractive, didn't he? His powerful preaching and words. He wasn't the light, but he certainly was a light. Amen. He partook of the light, didn't he? And where did he come from? <laughs> the authorities couldn't accept him. He did not have their papers. He had none of their degrees. He had not been thoroughly inspected. He had not learned from them. That was the point. He had not learned from, he was not teaching what they had taught him. He was teaching something different, and huge crowds were drawn to him. And what was he saying? Someone is coming after me. I am not fit to untie or tie his sandal. And the expectancy of the common people rose and rose and rose, and especially certain ones. Certain ones who had, who had come down there to follow John, and we know their names, don't we? Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew. Six of the twelve. Following John. They're listening to John. And immediately, all they had, all they needed was a word. Behold, they were waiting. Behold the Lamb of God. And immediately they just left him and followed. Some hung on. Some hung on to John. John had to push them away by saying, you go and ask him. He had to push them away because he knew the end was coming. He knew he wasn't going to get out of that dungeon. So he pushed them away. You go and ask him, are you the one or should we look for someone else? So they had this final confirmation then. It was not doubting. I can't count the number of times that I've read about people, yeah. people writing things and saying things about John cracking under the pressure. <laughs> yeah. Not at all. Right. He was preparing to be illuminated further himself <laughs> upon his graduation. Yeah. So he sent his disciples. He was that one who came, he was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of the light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man yeah, amen. coming into the world. Just previous to our, oh, I'm sorry, not previous to our, some months previous to the text that we're reading here. John records it in his eighth chapter, approximately six months previous. The Savior had said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Now, these two texts, of course, illuminate one another. These two statements illuminate one another. This statement and our, my focus text, they illuminate one another. They enhance one another. You gain understanding by comparing them, the words. And then a few weeks later, he would say, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And then he took some dirt and spittle and put the mud on the man's eyes. And he received light. Now we know that that's what our eyes do, don't they? They receive light for us to see one another, to see all things around it, have depth perception and... and uh, uh, peripheral vision and so forth. So we can see things. Our brother just had surgery on his eyes. He can see. Mm 
better now. <laughs> so if you've, if you've had those kinds of uh, experiences with your eyes and so forth, you know the, you know the, uh, uh, the joy, <laughs> the relief of being able to see. My father, in the last couple of years, had cataract surgery on both his eyes. I, I can see like I haven't seen in 20 years. He's 83 now. And seemed like that in 20 years. Well, this man had never seen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And he was going to tell everybody yeah. how he got to see. This man. He was not ashamed. Didn't matter to him that they threw him out. Yeah. I can see. I can go anywhere I need to now. I can see. I don't have to be received by them. I don't have to sit and beg money from them anymore. How many times had he received money from these men who ostentatiously presented it to him so that others would see that they were giving to the poor blind man? Yeah. But now the true light had enlightened him physically, physically, and in his heart and mind so that when the master found him again, He fell before him. And we know more. We know no more of this man. We can imagine. <laughs> we can imagine his devotion to the Savior. And who he really was. This, this man knew that what he saw in the one who gave him vision was more than seeing the world around him. He knew that. You could hear that in his words, in his testimony there before the elders. I love to read the words of Zechariah. Luke 1, 78, 79, through the tender mercy of our God, with which the day spring from on high has visited us to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Amen. Well, those, Amen. Those, are the, those echo the words of Isaiah that Sister Debbie read early, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Light to those who sit in darkness. Mm -hmm. Now we know in the earth that it has no light. Mm -hmm. Physically, the earth has no light. At all. It has to get light from another place. Everyone knows that. On a physical level. There's, there's no light in the earth. It comes from someplace else. It just so happens we call it the sun, don't we? <laughs> yeah. I'm waiting until someone demands in court that we change that name. Because it's too close. It's too close. <laughs> we also know that a tiny light in the darkness has a stunning effect. I remember when I was about eight or seven years old, something like that, our family went up the Lake of the Ozarks. We went down into a cave. We got down to the inn, and, of course, they turned out the lights. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, I'd never been in dark like that. Never. You, you could feel everything around you, you had a sense of it, but you could not, I, you literally could not see. And I had this panic, right? I still remember it to this day. I had this panic rising up within my little body. I, was, I came so close to saying, somebody turn the lights on! <laughs> that real darkness. And, and then, and then the, uh, the tour guide lit a match. Whoa, that was a lot of light, it seemed like. When you're seven years old and you're standing there in that total darkness... Yeah. I don't know whether it was really considered total darkness or not. So this is the illustration, see. Mm -hmm. But we've got the true light now, the, right. the light, all of the light that can be put into this earth, and it remain as, as it is, somewhat as it is. It, it, it remain a place where human beings can abide. If God sent his full light here, of course, the earth could not, could not tolerate, could not, and it will not. When the brightness of his glory appears, his glory, the glory of the angels, the glory of the Father, it will not. It will flee away, won't it? Yeah. Right. It will flee away. But for the matter of our attention now, 
No one has seen God at any time, John wrote. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. All things have been delivered to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and the one to whom the Son chooses or wills to reveal him. The Father loves the Son and gives all things into his hand. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. He is the Son of Man. So these things then he spoke, pointing to, without using the word light, but of course this is abundant light of his identity. This was the kernel of his teaching, who he was. He, he constantly turned attention to himself, forced people to consider these things of who he was mm -hmm. and from where he had come and what he was doing, what he was really doing. There were many, of course, who thought, well, he's feeding us and he's healing us and he's saving us from the enemies of our soul, that is, eliminating the demons running the demons out. That's what, that's what he's doing. But there were a few who recognized, oh, he's doing much more than that. And one of those few said one day, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Amen. And later on, Martha would declare then that same thing. You are the Son of God. And she saw a great light then when her brother walked out of his tomb. Many saw light. Of course, there were those who didn't want to see that light. And, and they tried from the beginning. I've already mentioned that. But all through his ministry, they tried to interdict it. They tried to turn it away somehow some way, something, we've got to do something. They ended up, of course, there at his entry, his final entry in Jerusalem. You see, what you're doing is no good at all. Why, the world has gone after him. They were so frustrated. This is the condemnation, he said. Right, And this was very close to the beginning of his ministry when he said these words. This is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil for everyone who for everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds be exposed but he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God so he's illuminating all things all things such is the manner of God's work he shone in the darkness. He worked in a realm creating faith. He's creating faith in people. He's created in us, hasn't he? Yeah. He has. He's given us faith. Amen. Because these things, these things are more than earthly physical matters that we would weigh the evidence for them. Like, you know, did he or didn't he? Or did this really happen or didn't this really happen? And those other kinds of historical events that we weigh the evidence in one way or another. These are much more than that. These are not weighable. The things that he's revealing are not weighable in the ordinary sense that we weigh evidence and decide if something is a truth or lie. Something's right or wrong. They can't, these things cannot be measured by human intellect in that sense. You just have to yield to the light. And of course, many are not willing to do that. Oh, that's too subjective for me. Too subjective. Well, you can just imagine that anything's true if you want to, you know. If you just think it's true, I think I can fly. I can climb up on the top of this house and fly to the Schifferdecker house, you know. People imagine things like that, don't they? And we're accused of imagining these things. Those who believed in him are accused of imagining. And they've just created this aura and this 
record. They just created this record of all of these things. There, you know, there are a lot of philosophies that like to talk about light, aren't there? All kinds of them, from all parts of the world. They like to talk about light. They don't talk about him. They want to talk about the light as a philosophy, as a concept, an intellectual concept that they can turn over and back, that they can manipulate around, that they can debate about, and on and on, back and forth. The like, like, Paul dealt, like Paul confronted there in Athens, huh? Yeah. They like to do nothing but talk and hear about something new. Like many in, in the current academic, or they've probably said this for some time, I don't know, but it seems like last well, three to five years I've heard it many times, you know, it's, it's not the destination that's important, it's the journey. See, they don't want to arrive anywhere. They don't want to come to a settled, they don't want to come to a settled reality. They just want to travel and look at things. What he's revealing is a settled reality. And it's revealed because it's true. It's not true because it's revealed. It was already true. He was the true light, which coming into the world, see? He already was that light. He came with these words. Now, I know there's all kinds of questions about his infancy, his childhood, and when this and when that and so forth that are not answered for us at all. They're things that God has kept for himself. They're things that we wouldn't, people just debate and philosophize about them anyway. You'd have one group that, that, that worshipped Jesus when he was a toddler, another group that worshipped him when he was an adolescent, another group that followed him the period of time when he was a teenager. If we knew those kinds of details, you'd have folks that would just sit right on that and would not move. And then, of course, we've got the 20-somethings who would sit right there if we knew those kinds of details. We know how people react over uh, what they call icons and so forth. And my goodness, if they had some tool that he used, if they had a, a, a window frame that he had built, you name it. Anything that he had fashioned with his hands, they would make that an idol as they did the bronze serpent. That's right. Men would do that, wouldn't they? And, they, and they'd, they'd have nothing to do with him who is the true light. They'd think that that was the light. See, that's what flesh does. Uh-huh. And fleshly thinking. So, in the words just before my primary text, John writes for us, although... He had done so many signs before them. They did not believe in him. That the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled which he spoke. Lord, who has believed our report to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe because Isaiah says again he has blinded their eyes Harden their hearts, lest they see with their eyes, should understand with their hearts, and turn so that I should heal them. Now, you all know that that second part of that quote is from Isaiah's commission, isn't it? He's told ahead of time that he's, his audience is not going to listen. But you go give it to them anyway. Yeah. You tell them. It's a record that God was faithful. Amen. And that now no one who heard these words has an excuse. None has, therefore they are without excuse, the apostle says. But whoever believes, his coming opens the way for believers, and it closes the way for the rest. It closes the way. Those who live in the unfruitful works of darkness will remain there. And God, of course, doesn't receive unfruitful works, does he? Even Job's, even Job knew that. Listen to these words. There are those who rebel against the light. These are Job's words. A man who had no Bible. 
There are those who rebel against the light. They do not know its ways nor abide in its paths. The murderer rises with the light. He kills the poor and the needy, and in the night he's like a thief. The eye of the adulterer waits for the twilight, saying, No eye will see me. And he disguises his face. In the dark they break into houses which they marked for themselves in the daytime. They do not know the light. You see, even without a Bible, human nature is not that hard to figure out, is it? Evil. Wicked human nature. It's not that difficult to peg and to describe. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. There's a statement. There it is. Laid plain, straightforward. He who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides upon him. The Savior said, most assuredly or truly, truly, I say to you, I prefer that truly, truly. He who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Jesus cried out, saying, He who believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. Now that's just previous to this text that we've been focusing on. I have come as a light into the world, that he who believes in me will not abide or remain in the darkness, shall not remain. I am the light of the world, he said. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Even Job's youngest friend knew this. He will redeem his soul from going down to the pit, and his life shall see the light. Behold, God works all these things twice, in fact, three times with a man. Plenty of evidence, see. Three times you're out. We all know that, don't we? To bring back his soul from the pit that he may be enlightened with the light of life. Now, again, those are the words of a man who didn't have a Bible. No revelation like what we have. But he knew these things. He knew these things. We don't know. The, the three friends were reprimanded by God. Nothing said about this man. So for those of us who believe, the Father has qualified us to be partakers of of the inheritance of the saints of light. You were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. You're all sons of light, sons of the day. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Amen. And of course that's what we need. Amen. And all the implications that go with it, of course. Fellowship with the Father and the Son that we would continue then to walk in the light. Brethren, let us do so. Amen. Thank you. God's grace and peace, brother.